Good evening. Tonight's demonstration is Kevin Bassett. I said that right this time. Yeah. He's going to be giving demonstrations on how different ways to hollow system, hollow, right? Something like that. All right. Cool. We'll figure it out as we go. That's what we always do anyway. All right, so give it up for Kevin Bassett. Um, Steve Wooster was supposed to do this demonstration, but, you know, since West Nile knocked him down up in Portland, uh, they had to come up with a, a, a second choice or, or maybe a third choice, uh, or maybe even further down the line than that, or maybe just find somebody that uh, doesn't feel bad about making a fool about himself in front of a room full of people. So thanks for coming, and uh, did I do that? All right. Whoa. Does that keep talking? Keep talking loud enough for you? Perfect. So we're going to talk about hollowing a little bit. And um, when hollowing, I think the main thing I wanted to get across tonight was uh, size matters. And it matters if you're doing something nice and small and compact like a Christmas ornament like this. And can you just use regular tools, um, regular hollowing type tools? Or if you're doing something like John's big vase over there. So it, it all, that di dictates what kind of equipment you might want to get. And as you start hollowing, you get to a point where, oh man, I made that a little bit too deep. I can't quite get all the way. So you either redesign and make it a little shorter vase, or you find bigger tools to hollow with. <laughs> Or different technique to hollow with and there's um, how many people here have never hollowed anything anybody okay well it's about a third of you I guess and so the other two-thirds of you you already know everything you can leave <laughs> um, because I'm not going to teach you anything new and I'm not going to do a lot of hollowing so um, but this um, just real quick on on Christmas ornaments how many do a lot of Christmas ornaments huh one, one, I said a lot. That would be at least two for you. <laughs> huh? Well, you're going to do more this year, right? Yes, Santa Claus. So um, when I do um, the ornaments, uh, I know a lot of people are better, high, more, got better skills than I do, and they can uh, hollow through little bitty holes. But uh, I hollow these from both ends. So I'll start with a big hole, and then when I get down here and I still got some fatness down here, well, I'll just flip it around. i leave me enough meat in here to grab it with one of these uh, little step jaw chucks. So that hole's, I don't know, maybe five-eighths, half. Um, and then this chuck allows you to do that. And if you're careful and don't over-tension it, you won't crack it. If you make it too darn thin and get too light, um, to prevent that, if you know you're going to be putting a lot of pressure and you know that kind of wood tends to split on you, you can always wrap it with a piece of fiberglass tape or something to give it a little, a little extra hole on there. And so these, these kind of things are made with, you know, um, I'm sure a lot of people have a little tool like this. Should I put it there? There. And, um... So it, it, this is basically a scraper, so you basically want to be right about de on dead center with the cutting edge of that, or maybe a little high so that you're kind of cutting downstream. And, you know, it's just, um, it's not too far out. You just basically, all these things, you using some kind of scraper to, and you hear that vibration, and you know what, I really don't care if it's got chatter marks on the inside, who's going to be looking in there anyway. So... Um, you may get some of that, especially if you get real thin. But uh, so ornaments are are a very good start to hollowing because when you look at it, this is basically one of Mr. Sexton's pieces. Just his is on steroids, so you're just making little ones. And but you know, you, it's a good it's a good place to practice, get a feel for and visualize where the tip of that tool tool is on the inside there, and. Um, um, measuring is sometimes a, a challenge, and um, there we go. So um, actually, I've, Andrea Martell came up with this little 
um, kind of a four-way and uh, so it's got a, a nice deep end here and a shallow end there and it, anyway it works pretty good for um, for measuring these sides and so there's my thickness right there or you know you if you're trying to get the check the bottom down there there's my thickness right there so it's a little bit thinner I'm a little bit fatter down here than I am up there now, ideally and especially with green wood you'd want that to be as equal as you can get it um, like I said for ornaments the reason for making them fairly thin in ornaments is to decrease the weight um, uh, you can if you use something like mesquite it's going to be heavy anyway if you use something like uh, a sycamore or some of the lighter weight woods then you'll have a lighter ornament so you can think about your wood when you're making ornaments if weight's important to you or just make it so paper thin that it doesn't have any mass to it or punch lots of holes in it to get rid of lots of mass so you <laughs> and you there's all kinds of decorative stuff you can do with that so that's that's all I had about ornaments and ornament hollowing does anybody have any questions about those things you want to send it around if, if if you if you go like a ranger, I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, baseball season's over. So in, in kind of that vein of smaller stuff, I think the harder things to hollow have either are either very flat on top, like um, Steve Wooster actually inspired this shape because he does a million of them it's a half circle on one side and pretty flat across the top and it's a devil to get in there or um, oof wait a minute look in the cat's head <laughs> something like an apple that's hollowed been sitting there for a while and so actually you're almost having to go negative in there to get up underneath that lip to get that even thickness so to get those kinds of spots um, you may need a tool and this one's been ground away I mean I think I've missing about right over the chuck yeah I think I've ground off about you know maybe three-eighths of an inch off the end of that so he's starting to lose his usefulness for me but um, that will get you, if you get way over here on the tool rest, that will get you right in there, and I can rub that all the way across to get that undercut. On the bigger, I, I've made these apples up to 16 inches in diameter, and that undercut on that big one's tough. You know, so you're looking at you know, finding a bigger tool that has the hook in it. And uh, if these things perform well or not, uh, the ones that get grabby, tools that get grabby or when... Uh, the point and the shaft get way out of line so the point sticking out further than the shaft is that'll be a tool that wants to spin on you so if the point and the center of the tool are about in the same plane then it should be behave like you want it to and won't always be grabbing and trying to spin in there and shatter your little piece so uh, little tools little pieces um, and you can actually go crazy on going small you don't always have to go big on stuff sometimes you can go the other way so a little teapot and that's hollowed so um, this uh, I might could do it yeah I could probably get that with that tool all the way around my fist is in the way here well I'll flip it upside down so that that's big enough but some of these I actually make uh, tools and um, you can use uh, an Allen wrench is a good tool steel to grind into any shape you want and they're cheap and you can if you mess them up throw them away and as far as making handles on them I don't even bother I just clamp it in a vice grip and use that so I'm kinda you know I'm, a lot of people like to make really nice hand tool handles so you do have fun grind you a little tool and put your handle on it and have fun um, I don't get to turn that often where um, the spout is not hollowed 
Um, you want to try and haul that, Murray? You can probably go at it from both ends and get there. No, the spout's not hollowed. The, sp the spout and the handle are, though, there's a material called uh, composition, comp compression wood, comp wood. And it's, uh, you can dry bend that to that radius. It's basically a one-inch thick board you can bend around a five-inch radius. So I turned me a little handle, and then I bent it. And not with steam or anything like that, just, just bent it. And that's the nature of that um, comp wood material, which is... Uh, very strange, and some of the stuff you see in AAW magazine that has little stuff going on like that. I think that's the way. I think that's the material they used to do a lot of those kinds of effects. Am I okay so far? All right. Um, yes. Uh, there's a company up in Seattle. I think that makes it. And you order it. They have a uh, about a hundred and thirty dollars. They'll send you a a bunch of stuff you can't use. Yeah, well, they'll send you some flat boards, you know, it looks, you know, like this timber. It's not really turning blanks per se, or, and so, you, you know, you, I end up doing smaller stuff with it and trying to bend it, um, cut them in strips and make bows and stuff like that, but, you know, you've seen it. Um, I think Jimmy's the first one that showed me the comp wood years ago. Man, it's a good thing you're not in Dallas court. <laughs> That's a $200 fine. <laughs> I bet he was. <laughs> um, so there's all manner of these different um, tools for hollowing um, mid-size stuff. So mid-size... And, and I would say you can hand handle uh, most everything. This is, you know, maybe three or four inches deep, maybe four and a half, five inches in diameter. And this kind of stuff you can hollow with, you know, regular kind of hand tools without much problem. And it's a good place to start. And just think at each step up in size, you're going to have to go bigger on tool. And um, uh, some of the big tools won't fit in the little holes, so <laughs> it gets a little difficult. Um, but, you know, and this is also cross-grained, and it's just a piece of oak, and it's probably so far out of round now, uh, sitting around drying for the last couple of days that uh, it probably, I don't know, it may not even fit in a chuck if it's oval enough. But um, so those kinds of things. And then, uh, you know, in hollowing, sometimes, you, you know, you see these effects like this with a skinny little neck and a little bitty hole. Well, you, you can't hollow through that little bitty hole as much as you'd like to. And as much as they'll lie to you and tell you, oh, yeah, I hold it right through all that. Don't you do it? Yeah. Well, yeah, usually it's got a little seam down here, and cleverly you, you try and hide where you made the plug and hollowed it from that end and just drilled through that end. But you can come up with some pretty nice, you know, long neck vases and stuff like that, which are, you know, kind of pretty, and people are always wondering, uh, how do you do that? How would you get it hollow? Yes. Yeah, think of all the wood still being down here, okay? And uh, and I drill me a hole down, at, you know, to where I'm not going to cut through the wall up here. And then I hollow that, right? And then um, uh, you should be able to f flip it around, put put your plug back in, glue that in, and then turn with the plug for your grip on the other side. Then you can do this and shape this and drill this. And then you flip it around one more time and put your little peg in here, come up on that bottom center, take off the foot, take off the plug. And voila, you've, you've done magic. So, so a lot of people don't even, they, have, they produce beautiful hollow forms and they don't hollow because they, they turn two bowls and then glue them back together. So it depends on how good you can hide your seams. And if, you, if you're doing decorative stuff or punching holes in things, you know, doing pierce stuff, you'll grind out about half of those lines anyway. So it gets pretty hard to detect them when there isn't very many of them. It also gets pretty darn fragile. Yeah, like your, like your mask. 
a segmented detail ring. Well, it would have to be segmented come from you. We're not talking about segmented things today, Murray. <laughs> We're talking about Halloween. And you got the wrong person up here for segmented. I can't have, I don't know how you divide everything by, you know, something into 360 and come out with an even number. <laughs> you guys, <laughs> engineers, what am I going to do with them? Oh. Hey, I just put that through your pretty little picture there. Hey, that's nice. I don't it didn't chip it too bad. All right. Um moving along. So a lot of these some of these tools you'll see out there are like these that are flattened on a bottom so you know, when you set that in there, that gives you something to to work off to keep that from wanting to spin a little bit. Um uh Donald Derry has a a tool for making the Christmas ornaments that has a little um, ring here and a wire that fits there so there's actually two points of contact on the rest to keep it from spinning like that. Anytime you've got this point and you like this tool if you look that points further out than this thing so this tool is kind of wanting to jump around on you a little bit and spin that's why they ground up half and two to make it a, have a flat spot there so you got a chance to keep that flat on the rest and not have it torquing around on you as bad. But Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. I mean, all these tools have um, have usages, and they make you know they make a straight one like that. Here again, that's that's way off of this center line running through here. So this kind of, you know these that's why they cut these flat was so that you would have you know some wider surface to make that a little more stable. But it still wants to catch and flip on you. So you got to kind of be careful with any of these kinds of tools when you're using them. And, and I'm a sucker. I've bought them all. Um, then you and, and all these I you know kind of classify these as hold, uh, hand tools. So they're good for you know my cat bowl um, box, whatever he is, my stupid cat thing. Uh, you know that's a, that's about as far as you want to go over the tool rest with these kind of tools. So you're going to start having problems, and it starts to be physically more demanding and more difficult so then you graduate up and say well instead of doing using these teeny little hand tools maybe maybe i need to come up with a bigger tool so i can get a little deeper um and so um i just happen to have several of them here it's kind of which one do you how, where do you want to start um well um um mr bosch now that's the short i Actually, I took this thing and I've cut off about s four or five inches off of that tool because I use it in my deep hollowing bar. So this isn't, you, you really, any, any of these with the swan neck on them, you need to pull the tool rest a little further away from the piece so, um, so it's more stable. And you can see how this point is pretty much in line with the center. So it makes it a better more controllable tool when you start going in there. And this is what you need for doing these, you know, these big, long, flat kind of cuts in there when you're cutting right along the top. You need a pretty good swan neck to get in there. Right, Jimmy? You're looking at me quizzically like, what's he talking about? <laughs> I didn't teach him that. <laughs> um, I had to Right, that, you know, Jimmy was kind of my mentor and showed me uh, a quite a bit about turning. And mostly, he just let me use his shop and and let me just destroy myself in there. <laughs> so, and his shop. <laughs> and Roger gave me a lot of help. And you know, he uh, Roger was the first one when I first started uh, going up to Jimmy's shop and turning a little bit. Uh, Roger was the first one to introduce me to a bevel, and I said, "What's a bevel?" He said. We, you don't know what a bevel is? I said, no. He says, just keep making sawdust, Kevin. That's what you're good at. So, <laughs> so I have. I just keep making uh, making more and more sawdust. Um, so this is um, one of Trent Bosch's hollowing tools. And so you see, he's just gotten bigger and bigger and longer and longer with the handle. So you're out here. Well, that'll take you. Uh, one of the things that you need to kind of know for every inch I hang that tool off that tool rest I need five inches behind me 
if I go five inches deep, I need 25 inches back here to be able to control that tool. Otherwise, you're going to start it's going to start wanting to catch and throw you up in the air. So, you know, I'm always marveling that John doesn't have pieces of his roof stuck in his head, you know, because he's doing these great big old deep things. And but he's got a trick, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. But these, you know, these for these have a limit. You you can go about with this tool. I'm comfortable about eight, maybe nine inches, and after that, forget it. I can't control it, and I, I'm about 200 pounds, and I'm, uh, and I, you know, kind of an old tree guy, and I, you know, brute strength and ignorance is my, those are my um, mottos. <laughs> if it, if it, uh, if it's stuck, force it. If it breaks, you needed a new one anyway. It's tree man mentality. Um. So nowadays, um, these easy tool guys and. Uh, What's the one Steve sells? These these carbide type tip cutters. I like these are good. These are good for hollowing. I don't think they're good for doing fine work on the outside because they're just basically a, a scraper. Um, several guys make these. So this is a replaceable tip. They cut. They're pretty aggressive. So you'll get material out of there. Uh, this, of course, is for going on the on the inside curve and in this area. But if we get that up where you can see it on the TV. Oh, yeah, there you go. I'll turn it like that. So the, you need the curve for about like that. When you get down in here in the bottom, you need something that's more straight to get in there, to get to the bottom. Um, when you start, uh, it's easiest for me to um, start by drilling, and so you know you use your Forstner bits. And um, the only thing about any of these drill bits is this little point. You gotta hold it right down there. Yeah, the point sticks out beyond the teeth over here that are doing the cutting here, and so you always got that little pit hole down in the very bottom of your piece, which you know you're gonna have to deal with one way or the other. Even ignore it which I do a lot of, or uh, at the end, you got to go catch that last little bit on the bottom to make it nice and smooth and flat across the bottom, if you care about that. Some people do. I don't really. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think that if, if there's a little pit in the bottom of the piece that of a hollow form that anybody should get too upset about that, but, um, but they do. Um, so this has got a little extension on it and that goes in the tool stock and then you can drill this down and get your depth just where you want it to begin with. So when you get done that far down you end up, I'll go to a different piece here altogether that I've drilled. Ooh, better put it over here. Yeah. I've never broken a shaft. Um, I wouldn't say that. You're giving me more credit than I deserve there for sure. I got holes in my ceiling, dude. <laughs> uh, you're nodding yes, you've seen them. <laughs> So this is like an apple form I did, and I've drilled it out and gotten um, the approximate depth that I'm going to on this, and then you know we'd hollow this, and and that's just all hand tools because it's small. Um, when you get to the bigger stuff, uh, you can use um, some of these other systems. Um, how many of y'all know who Donald Derry is? Handful. And taking a class from him, uh, seeing him hollow. Um, Donald's to put a lot of thought into things. And for these mid sized pieces, let me uh, get this up on here. My 
chose the mesquite one if we're going to do any hollowing on here because that's, I figured it wouldn't move any. Maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, we'll see when we turn it on. So um, Don's system uses, and uh, Mr. Sexton was up here looking at these square bar uh, cutters, bars up here, and um, this is all from Don. So um, that basically is going to go in there. And this, since this is, since these bars are pretty fat here, um, that kind of works for the whole trap. And then it's got a little laser system, um, which you can see that's just about, well, it's a pretty lousy laser light. It's pretty fat, not very focused. Yeah, well, that's because I have to have something underneath it for you to see. Otherwise, it's just shining on the floor. Can you see it now? Well, here, let me move out a little further. About out there. I can see down on it from above. but um, So the laser's just set up where it's just a whatever the wall thickness you want and uh, you hollow and you can set this um, let's see if we'll see it on the side of the piece there we go uh, so if I kind of crank this out if I w I've hand hollowed just the inside lip here and if that's going to be my thickness I can I can come back here and kind of catch um, where that is on the with the laser need a piece of tape um, to hold the button down um, yeah, push it out. Go the right direction. So eventually that dot will fall right off the piece. And when it does, I'm at my thickness. So somewhere right about in there. So you, if you have a, put a piece of cardboard down here for you to look at, and when it runs off the piece, you'll know you're at your wall thickness. So if I come back here and... Um, something like this up there I can kind of calibrate that so that would be about from what I can tell that's uh, right at about a quarter of an inch thick and um, you'll notice that the cutter is facing this way so uh, probably ought to make sure that this is on good and tight and uh, or use the locking screws here because as we turn this, it's going to be wanting to spin this piece off the chuck. And Roger's going to get to catch it. <laughs> um, but so we use reverse. And turn that way. And uh, I wish, you got a piece of tape over there? Yeah, you do. Yeah, blue tape's perfect. Blue tape's good. Yeah, that's turning backwards. Yeah, it's reversed. Well, you know, we can turn the other way. You just won't cut. Here, look, watch. I'll show you. No, no cut. The, the advantage to this over turning that way is your body position it is is more ergonomic that's why he did it um, so you reverse the lathe and you can go like this so now on this guy you can go um, I've been able to go about 10 9 10 inches with this tool and no further so you know you can yeah it's wanting to jump a little bit I need to tighten these so um, hmm it's right there. Here, I need another wrap of tape, huh? Pull tighter. Um, with this tool, yeah. Yeah, you do. It gets snaky down here, for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it gets a little crazy. Seven, eight inches. Look, look at the size Donald Derry makes. You know, he makes nice vessels about that big. You know, and, and you know, nice preg shape. You know, you got your egg and you got your pear. And if you put those two, two together, you get the preg. So it's, you know. <laughs> um, with the square bars, actually the square bars, because of the cross-section of them, according to Don, you can, you can replace a three-quarter inch shaft with a half-inch square bar. Mm-hmm. Are they square? Three-quarter. Right. It's, it, right. Right. So that's when you go to the bigger thing. So anyway, that's the dairy tool. It's a left-threaded kind of deal. It's got its limitations, but it has a nice laser system with it. Uh, seems like it was 300 bucks, and then another 90 or so for the extra bars, and I'll send those around just to kind of um, – so he's got a, a cutter like that, and he's got another – here, I'll put it down here for you. Let me turn that off before I stick that in it. How about that? That make you happy? Like that? Yeah, that's good. We'll send them around. They can get a better close up on them. But the, the square bars are interesting, and this kind of a um, a trap is kind of interesting to me. So he's he did a lot of thinking on it, and it works pretty good. And it's especially, you know, if you're not going too big, it's a pretty neat little hollowing system. Um, and it's not supposed to do that, <laughs> but it did. Um, so a while back, um, we had a little tool auction for Mr. Mattern's stuff when, when Bob left us and his wife wanted to get rid of his tools. Murray? Right. You were talking about this one. Right. Right. And when you get down that deep, you're not looking to be gouging out a whole bunch of wood at once anyway. You know, you've already done most of the wood removal with, uh, with the drill bit. And, 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 um, so, and also when you start, you know, you start up here at the end and you, uh, well, you drill a hole all the way down to your full depth if you can. A lot of times on this bigger stuff you have to take it in steps. Uh, and then start, get your thinness here, and then just start working it down the sidewall. And, um, you know, as you go down, you can take a little more out of the middle, but you need to leave this mass down here. Um, when you get way far down, actually, it gets more stable. You just have, this is just out here spinning around. It's not really affecting. So that the, the place you're going to get any vibration or any problems is going to be up here on the top. And if you do, and so say, let's say this piece is this long, if you're, you know, going to 18, 20 inches deep, uh, or even on some this size, if you're starting to get a lot of chatter and movement in there, you need a steady. Well, my steady's not really set up for a 16-inch lathe, you know. I, uh, but the steady's all coming. This one's mine, and there's about a million of them out there, different varieties. And so these wheels, this clamps down onto the ways. And these wheels are um, adjustable, and they come in here, and, and you'll set it in there about oh, maybe a third of the way down. Pull these wheels up against the piece, make sure it's running smooth and tracking. And um, 
tighten these rascals up. And then when you're hauling out here, it'll take that vibration out because you're supporting it in two places. And that's the whole, when you're deep hollowing, these things get to be part of the game. So you end up, you know, it's quite an investment. You know, the deeper you go, the more money you're going to spend. Who is it that said Jimmy was talking about his uh, grandson um, going all over the country, uh, what is it, waterboarding? Wakeboarding. Wake surfing. Yeah, he's wake surfing. Well, I, you know, it's boarding on water, so I figured that's waterboarding. <laughs> um, yeah, he said that when you get into this, you, dr you drive about three miles and you throw a $100 bill out the window, and that's how, you, how it works. And that's kind of how this uh, hollowing stuff ends up going, too. You, en you end up, you know, you, g you just get, it just sucks you in, and... Uh, Next thing you know, you, you're, like, you're like Mr. Tisdale back there. Of course, you know, see, he's, he's got one interest. He, like John will tell you, I'm a one-trick pony, but it's a pretty good trick. Yeah. Where th this pony and a lot of other ponies in this room uh, have gotten more versified, I guess, diversified, and we do a lot of different things. So we have a, you know, you just start to end up, well, oh, What's that, 60 bucks? Oh, that looks like fun. I'll take one of those, you know. <laughs> so, you know, you end up collecting this stuff over years. Um, so, it, you know, in some ways, and uh, um, Brian Evans isn't here, but, you know, there's cert a lot to be said with just getting really good at spindle turning. <laughs> and you got a skew and a gouge and a parting tool, and that's really all you need. You know, and, and that's turning at its best sometimes. Simple, lots of skills developed, and so forth. But for this kind of stuff, it, it's more equipment intensive, I guess, because of how far we're going off the tool rest. So um, Mr. Mattern had a piece up here in the tool sale. Okay, and so here again, this is set up for a whole different size lathe, so I'm just going to show it. This is, this is the secondary tool rest. So, oh, I got a stop in the way. Glad I'm strong enough to take it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll pick that up later, too. And that. So, this sits back a ways. Fits down in the ways clamps in there yeah it's too big I'd have to put it in underneath but let's just show it and that holds can you steady that for me just hold that for a second let me let me turn around here and w reach into my bag so this rascal uh, tool rest so you get this thing all set up where he's nice and level. This bar fits in that. That fits on top of the tool rest. Yeah, I need a third hand. I need a taller rest too. So uh, don't worry about that. Here, I got it now. So this sits on the tool rest. You set this up where it's all nice and level and parallel and right on the midpoint. And then that can just slide back and forth. The cutter does the work. The laser tells you the wall thickness. And this device uh, is pretty comfortable at about 11 or 12 inches. Fred, you made this for Matt Bob? Uh, are you taking orders? Because there might be, after this demo, I might sell a couple of them for you. I like this device a lot. The, uh, I, I feel like there should be a, a top. Timber! What else is going to fall? We break anything? Oh, good. I'm working on it. I'll get it eventually. And if it breaks one of those, the only thing I'd be unhappy about would be the apple. <laughs> and it's over there. So, um, so these devices, and you can see, and, and this actually, you know, you can get out deep enough on this where you're actually probably wanting to have the steady in there. 
this bar will slide back and forth and go anywhere you want it to go. Just just throw it on the chair, Jimmy. I'll be fine. So Fred made this, and he did a great job. The only thing I'd change is, is this. That's my top. He had that, so you didn't make this part. Just this part and this part. Yeah. Well, I ended up, the coupling here, I ended up uh, putting JB Weld in there and making it solid because the two joints were wobbling too much to part. And then I put an extra screw hole, lo another lock screw in there just the other night to get this a little bit more secure where it didn't want. Because here again, the tip's off the center line, so you're putting a lot of this on it. And if you've got a, a, a lock screw up here, it's going to just want to loosen it up over time. Yeah, it's not flat. Yeah, you can throw it in the cat if you want. She'll take a bite. Um, so that's that one. Um, this is kind of, you know, when I, Jimmy, thanks, Jimmy. When, when uh, Jimmy st first started showing me hollow, and this was the system, and that's been 10, 15 years ago. So this has been around a while. It's tried and it's true, and most of what you see out there is some adaptation form or another of this system. M Lyle Jameson. So now one of the things that Jimmy's done is instead of having all this big square out here, which, you know, when you're at some points on this thing, um, you start running out of room and you need to get a little more angle, then you have to start, you know, this, this actually will slide on this post, this part here, will slide back and forth. So you end up having to make some adjustments. But by having just two bars welded together, you get enough fatness here for the trap to work. But it takes this kind of awkward thing here out of the out of place. So I saw that at SWAT with two boring bars welded together, and and just leaving this part out down here. It stops about like there, and there's just two bars running up this way. So it's a little cleaner and probably easier to store than this thing. And so they've made some some strides, but the basic system, if you look at hollowing systems, they're all going to be pretty much these same principles in, in how they work. Okay, so you can, the, the guy that, uh, that we're all, thanks Jimmy, that we're all um, kind of been in awe of for, uh, when did Ed Mothrop start hollowing stuff? Is that from the 70s? Yeah. Um, Ed's no longer with us. If you want to see some huge hollowing type work, uh, Ed Mothrop is is uh, probably the acknowledged uh, genius and master that started this all together to begin with. But his approach was completely different. He just made one heck of a long bar out there, boring bar, to cut on the inside. And he's done vessels as tall as this lathe that his grandkids stand in, and you only see that much of their head. So he's done, done, did some really massive stuff. He soaked it in peg. Well, yeah, and he had, uh, and let's see, he was in Georgia around Atlanta, right? And so he had massive trees. So he was turning tree trunks. Huge, huge, huge stuff. Um, I've never seen anybody but his that even approaches it. Have you? Do you know anybody that's turned anything bigger than Ed has on a regular basis? That's that's when I say you know there's there's going, um, there's hollowing, there's going big, and then there's going crazy. <laughs> and Murray, I know what you know what that is with your segmented work and French horns and pianos and everything else that you've made with the segmented world. It's an exercise in, hey, I'm going to figure out how to do this. Yes. That's the lathe. Was it a bowl? Yeah. 
Yeah, I saw I saw one that was running around on the internet last year. Uh, that's a tractor, and they actually ran the tractor up, set it up on giant blocks, have the bowl, um, you know, the tractor rims basically your chuck faceplate, and screw a giant piece of. Well, actually, theirs to me, I think it was segmented. It looked like plywood. They'd done a hell of a glue up job on it, and the guy was standing there turning the outside of this bowl and the pieces, you know, it's got to be 12 foot in diameter. So there's some real sickness out there if you, uh, <laughs> I hadn't got there yet, you know, I drew up a plan for building a lathe that could do something like that, but then, you know, I had to get permission from the city of Wiley to build it, I think, you know. <laughs> I'm afraid their building code may not like it. Hey, it's light industrial zoning where we're at. We should be able to do whatever we damn well please, right? Um, not so. So now, um, Mr. Arledge was kind enough. So this is one of the new things. But it's basically the same thing. Does yours fit in here, Jimmy? How about that? Look at there. So this is the monster. If I'm doing something wrong, let me know. So far, so good. There we go. So there's the monster. Now this is also set up for a bigger, taller lathe. So, you know, we might not actually do much hollowing today. We're going to kind of, like I said, have show and tell for the equipment. And if you're looking at hollowing, you may want to look at some of these things instead of buying everything that comes down the pike like me. You can figure out, you know, hey, I think I like that system best. So the monster has a laser built in little battery powered one does it work yeah how about that see and it, look at how nice see my lasers one that you is a cat toy laser <laughs> so I got a great big can you not see that do I need to be on this end a little more there you go how about that so um, my laser dot is ten times that size that's very precise that's a nice laser I like that And punch a little hole in it. That's so smart. I should have known that, you know, because we used to look at the sun eclipses doing that with the point in the box. Yeah, not that, you know, I forget about all that stuff after a while. So, Jimmy, did I, um, where's your cutter tool? Did I lose that already? Somebody steal that? Oh, yeah, I did. You said this one would work on it, right? Well, just probably, you know, this stuff's interchangeable. I can probably use Mattern's old scraper for it. Nope, too big. Too big. We can get there somehow, right? So this is, these extensions Jimmy had made for this so he can go deeper and deeper and deeper. So that's one extension. You got that plus your um, preferred cutter. Actually, this one would fit in there, wouldn't it? Whoa. I hope that wasn't electricity. It just hit the plastic hit, right? It almost sounded like it started arcing. <laughs> yeah. So. No, it didn't. It's too tall. <laughs> so this goes in. And you can control that just like that. Yeah, the laser's got to be over the tip. So you extend this. Here. There's a light right down here on the bottom. Here, let me get it over here where you can. S um, this is the one with the dead battery, Jimmy. It's one of John's LED bulbs. It's a little LED. So it's got a little two 180 lumens. So with 180 lumens inside there, you don't need the laser because there's going to be, an, if you're using a light-colored wood like sycamore or maple, you'll be able to see through that or pear. You'll be able to see 
that light as you're hollowing. Just turn the lights down, dim in the shop, and you'll see right through the piece. Yeah, yeah it starts off, it's dark, and then it gets orange, and then it gets yellow, and gets bright yellow. And it's brighter yellow, and then it gets white. That's exactly right. You just go all the way through it. But this, I, you know, these things are, what I worry about on these, and, and why I haven't bought one, is I've always been worried about the torque on this arm. Now, see, that starts to develop a little bit of slop in there, but you've got a tool rest in front here, too, so you're supporting it in two places. But this, these have always have nice little action on them. You see, Roger can do this with one hand. So it, it makes hollowing a lot easier. Wall thickness guidance. And like he said, you want to put the laser over the tip. And bear in mind where you're hollowing on this because you may need to adjust the laser around the tip to that position when you're down here because that's the part of the cutter you're using. When you're up in here, you're using a different part of the cutter. So you've got to set it up and... Otherwise, you may find yourself going through because you know if your wall thickness is very shallow and you don't keep rotating that laser around the cutter tip, you may find yourself cutting a little more wood out of there than you expect. Yeah, well, yeah, right down here in the bottom, as you know, it, yeah. Right. So that's a three quarter right there. Mm hmm. What about that one? <laughs> So anyway, so this will get you. How deep have you gone with this system, Jimmy? How, and Martin, how far have you gone on there? You've gone 30 inches on this? Jeez, you're a sick man. Yeah, the trouble, you know, these things are make it are very ergonomic. You know, that makes the work a lot easier. Um, and... You can you, you can keep going a little crazy now. Jimmy says he's done thirty inches on this. I have to see that too. You know, um, I don't doubt it because you know he's a sick man. <laughs> uh, yeah. Pardon me. No, no, you're cutting on this side now. No, the only, the only system you run in reverse is that dairy system where the cutters are on the other side. See, you're cutting down this side in the Donald Dairy, and you're cutting on towards you on the side towards you in everybody else's system. That's right. You can flip the darn thing over and flip the tip around in the tool. I mean, it, you, it, it, there's no end to figuring out ways to do things a little bit different that if that appeals to you to be cutting on this side, the trouble with dairies, as far as I'm concerned on that, is it's hard for me to see the laser dot. I want the laser dot towards me, not away from me. So I find myself having to set up a mirror or something over here where I can look down and see. And, you know, I'll put a piece of wood here for it to, for it to reflect down onto. Otherwise, I have to watch the floor and the sawdust. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's uh, well, he's left-brained, you know, <laughs> or right-brained, whichever way it is for you know people that think in reverse. He's he his parents were probably Kiwis or something, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was to get away from the flipping edge. Yeah, you know, you can you can utilize both spins both rotations of the t of the tool that's just exploring all methods all that the versatility that this machine has for you you know you can cut going that way just as easy as you can cut going this way the only drawback is it wants to unscrew your chuck for you so and and i've had that kind of happen 
but not to where it threw the piece off because you know you've got this up here blocking and so you start noticing it getting a little bit wobbly and then you notice that all of a sudden this is up against your tool rest and that's about as far as it's going to go and it just starts rubbing and rubbing and rubbing and starts pushing so you generally I, I, it di I didn't let it go to its conclusion um, because I was quick enough to say, uh oh, I'm in trouble and s shut off the lathe. You know, the first sign of any unnatural vibration or any kind of problem, turn the lathe off, find out what it is. Don't keep going. Don't be a hard head. Now, I've been a hard head because I'll just, you know, oh, it's just a little vibration. Keep just, hey, put more pressure on it. That works. Yeah. away from it yeah you know you we all adapt rogers adapted to being a one-handed turner and he's one of the best turners around and and he knows what he's doing well you're welcome you are you're one of the best turners period and much less one that only turns with one hand you know he, roger can turn better than most of us with the hand tied behind his back it's not fair it's not fair um, so I anyway, I got a little bit now. I know you all have seen this big stuff over here that John does, and I'm going to just get him rolling. He's got a little PowerPoint, and uh, him and Mr. Sexton are going to come up and show you. Um, uh, you got to love our innovativeness. <laughs> that, that's a Raleigh Monroe hollower. Okay, see that rascal there? And so that's all adjustable. So that tip can replace this for about three or four different tools. Because you can get under the shoulder, you can go straight down the side, you can do the flat bottom, you can get it all with that one cutter because of the articulating nature of the front of it. And um, so since <laughs> Jim did, did these two big vessels over here, and uh, so, you know, uh, I think John and I are kind of pokey along too much for, uh, because, you know, it ta may take, you know, 10 or 12 hours to hollow one of those big meaty things, whereas uh, he'll go through the same size vessel in about two hours. So he's five times more efficient than we are. So I'm going to kind of turn this over to John. He's going to talk about some of these... Um, And, thi and this is heading towards Mothrop, but not there yet. Look at that tool. So he, his lathe is about, what, about this high? He's got his ma lathe mounted tall, on, on, and so he's standing on the ground there. And so to turn the outside profile, he's got a, a stand back here. Uh, um, what do you have, a couple of... Uh, yeah, you have a platform built up, so you can turn this at this level, and then when he hollows, he stands down on the ground there, and the tool's much higher. So it's like Trent Bosch, where you're, it's easier to hollow if everything's up here about chest level than if you're bending over to do it, because that, that'll start to kill your back after a while. So um, I think John has a PowerPoint. Here, let me give you the... Let me give you the mic. I don't need the mic. I don't think. Do I need the mic? Yeah, we want it on the tape. Let me just let me just give you this. I'll hold the mic for him. All right. I'll be the interviewer. Did you just want to let Yes, sir. <laughs> just talk. Right there. All right. use and I, I have three tools this one and two hollowing bars and with that you can do a piece like that you can do anything on the table we'll do pieces up to 22 inches in diameter and uh, there's t t to my way you know I'm just you just don't need that much material I don't own a hook tool or I, I take it back I uh, own one but it's been in a drawer gathering dust for about three years. Um, and I gave one away. But here, I'll hold that just a minute. 
This, uh, I got too much to hold. Anyway, uh, this, this, this is the secret right here. And, and you'll notice it's got a pin. And for the, for the life of me, I can't figure out why anybody would want a wood turn while, by holding the tool and then fighting with it. Why not just let the tool pivot against a uh, pin and then stand a comfortable distance away and just work the tool? It's comfortable. Uh, so would I No, not really. This is this is more like Mothrop, but Junior. Well, it doesn't work with this, but with this design, I can get this into any of these uh, hollow forms you see here. Now, w one thing about the way I do things, it lends itself to medium to larger things. If you want to go, uh, the the small ones, probably the little hook tools and things like that, make a lot more sense. But with this, I, I, uh, I, can, I can put it in, I adjust my pin, usually near the opening, and with a straight tool, now this is one that I don't use much anymore, but it's just a simple uh, 3 16 cutter, and I can do almost everything in. Now one uh, tool that he didn't show you. Yet. When you're doing under the lip stuff, this is a really great tool. Now, with a tooling pin, and again, I'm having a hard time with mic and tools and stuff. But anyway, you hold this outrigger right here, so I can extend the cutter up to an inch, and I can do virtually a flat top, and I can do it 12 inches this way, if if the piece is actually that big. And for this bar right here, I had machined at a machine shop. It cost me 40 bucks. This is a couple of collars for $5 each, and this is a piece of strap iron from Home Depot. And that's, so I've got a $50 investment plus this handle here that was laying around the shop. And I can sit there and, I, and with the height of my lathe, I'm flat footed, I can do it. There's no twist, there's no problem, and it's just as controllable as it can be. But the pin has got to be there. That is one, I, I couldn't work without a pin. Uh, on, because my lathe is 52 inches up, I'm not looking straight into the hole, I'm looking kind of down at it. But what I do is I use the Raleigh Monroe exclusively. I don't use the 3 16ths anymore, but it's kind of hard with all this stuff, but I'm usually standing what I call at five o'clock. Uh, I do all my work, so my lathe is in the middle of the room, and I can have this positioned in. And one of the advantages, and, and there's a subtle advantage that maybe has escaped, uh, you know, at first glance. But these outside tool rests that are just bars going across, they're the best thing in the world for doing the outside. They have no place at all in hollowing. Because I know what I want to do is I want the cutter at 9 o'clock. I don't want it at 8.30. I don't want it down. I don't want it at, at uh, 9.30. I want it right at that part of the lathe at 9 o'clock. Center line. So by looking at the tool rest here, I know exactly where I am at any one time. Now at this point right here, if the tool rest is this far in, I can be cutting into a 10 inch piece, no problem. Now I have longer bars at home where I can put this same cutter and I can go as deep as I want. But I'm only two or three inches over the edge. This stuff about going 12 inches over and all this kind of stuff, that just scares the hell out of me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it, I wouldn't try it. Uh, now I did on that one, I had no choice, but I, and I used a bigger bar. But uh, anyway, this works. It's easy. Uh, I can, you know, I can drink a couple of beers and hollow out a piece, no problem. It's just not that big a deal. It's, 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 you just never get into trouble.
Good thing the safety officer's up in Portland. And, and, and Jim, you, you do more than that, don't you? <laughs> yeah, no, he doesn't need to drink. Yeah, ever since he invented pumps. <laughs> but, He's uh, crazy <laughs> enough to begin with. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it, it's kind of hard. It's kind of a new concept. Now, uh, you notice it's got LEDs on it. Uh, if there's if there's an extension cord here, we can plug it in. I can show you how One right down there on the floor. Um, you can't plug into that. Watch your head coming back up. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is going inside, so you're illuminating the, uh, the thing. Hold that. I'll go get one of Jim's vessels, and you can show how that goes in there. So, uh, and, and these are 70 lumens, I think. They cost 10 bucks each. They need some uh, tie wraps replaced. Pardon me? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> so what they're getting at here is because of that curve, that can go all the way down in there. Yeah, it's Am I in your road? In fact, why don't you come around here with it? Let's, let's just spin it around. There we now go. These are, these are not How about lasers. that? Can you see that? These are not lasers. So, um, and sometimes I want, I want to see shadows, so I'll adjust the lights accordingly. Uh, so I'll see what I want to, so, so I'll see like I want to see it. Uh, but I'm, I've always got the lights on because I just don't like. Uh, you don't like hollow and blind. Yeah, yeah. And, and even though I'm not watching the cutter, you know, and if and I when I clean the uh, uh, the shavings out, I can feel along, and if I can see a, a a thick spot, and you can see them, you can see the shadow in there. Sometimes I'll stick my hand in there and I'll mark it with a piece of chalk, no big deal, and then I'll go in and I'll cut that area and and just make a nice clean cut. So it's it's easy to do. I can go through pieces uh, 20 inches in diameter this is about a 16 inch piece I guess and never never get one catch it's just it's easy because one thing with a handheld bar because you're riding with it and feeling it all the way you're not you don't have all this linkage where you're forcing things to happen too quickly and also with the Raleigh Monroe you're doing a sheer cut with with the cutter you're not doing a scraping cut like you're doing with these others. So the forces are a lot more, they're a lot more agreeable. Really works. So. Uh, I think the proof's in the pudding. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, I didn't personally make it. I had a machine shop make it. I had, uh, back on the last go round, I had a machine shop you you got one. I got one right there. Yeah, and uh, I made. Uh, I can't remember if we made three or five or three or four or five. I don't remember. Yeah, for for guys. And uh, if you go in together, you can get a better deal with the machinist. And they're, they're about four hundred bucks. Fred will make it. But uh, four hundred bucks, you're all over it, right? Well, you need. <laughs> you know, it 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 takes a, it takes a serious you know pretty serious shop to be able to cut this thing out and then drill the holes and then tap them there's a lot of work now this one's stainless steel uh it costs 50 bucks more than uh than than kevin's kevin got a mild steel yeah mine's mine's not as pretty uh, <laughs> but um that and 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 i i just totally believe there's no need for a hook tool in any of this work especially if you're doing big now if you're going small then you need hook tools for all the little little things you do but this tool right running here out of time will will do a uh, will complete any piece that you're going to try so john can you do your uh, you want to do your Oop. we're we're done when we start quitting at well, nine just, just stick it on we'll, we'll do it it won't take but two minutes to go through it 
Yeah, look right down there on okay. the chair. I'll uh, I'll talk real quick. Okay, there's uh, to to lift a 250 pound log. It takes a chain hoist, needless to say. Not me. Uh, mount it on the lathe. Then you start profiling. You always cut the outside. Uh, lots of worms. Then uh, that's the uh, that's the piece right there. Just now, that's my steady rest right there. I've got a big, heavy, steady rest. There I am. Now on this one, if we could stop it, if you could turn back. It don't stop. It don't stop. Okay. Talk faster. <laughs> yeah, can, can you can you flip back a little bit? You can flip back again. Flip back again. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, right there. Stop right it's there. It's a one-way. Stop right there on the hollowing. Now, that's where I'm using the internal tool rest. On that, that was the second one of those. That's number three that you see over there. On the second one, I used a captive that I had laying around the shop, and it was pure misery. Uh, I'll never do it again. So, and you'll see on the next uh, slide, you'll see the captive. It's a gizmo that a guy up in Oklahoma did that, uh, like I say, it's anybody that's got 10 bucks, I'll sell it. Uh, but the steady rest is a good one. The, the guy up in Oklahoma did a great steady rest. Go ahead and advance. Uh, again, back to that captive system. Now, uh, I'll, I'll usually dry the logs for about eight months. And then, uh, okay, go ahead. Then the filling and the final cutting starts. That's all epoxy. So I'll put in, I was talking a minute ago about uh, being liberal with epoxy, and that's all black epoxy. Advance. Again. So it's just a few pictures of epoxy. Now you can see where I'm cutting the epoxy off. Epoxy is tough to sand, so it's, it's, it's a good stuff to cut. So I'll do a couple of applications of that. Again. Again. And then you finally get it again. That's with the water base right there, which uh, actually winds up looking good. But you could sand that stuff very easily. Again. And then that's, uh, it's hard to see what's going on there, but that's where it's taped up because I have to have it sandblasted. After uh, 10 coatings of material, uh, the uh, coating globs into the uh, negative space areas and looks like hell. And so I, I uh, tape it up, get it all sandblasted, and get those areas cleaned up, and then I put the final finish on it. And then you have that. So that's it. So it all depends on how crazy you want to be. Any questions? We're running late. Oh, I didn't carve anything. I'm, I appreciate you thinking I might have that much talent. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> no, I don't. Anybody else? Okay. Let's get out of here. Thank you.